Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. We're going to talk about AEW Dynamite. What a dreadful show. So bad, in fact. Even people who are fans of Dynamite are talking about how bad this show was. Now, because the CM Punk Young Bucks situation is so big, I decided to give it its own video because I would hate to turn this thing into an hour-long video talking about just that. So, I'm going to separate that, put it in another video. This is for everything else. This is for the rest of the show. So, we start the show with Samoa Joe versus Dustin Rhodes. Swerve Strickland attacks Samoa Joe during his entrance. Uh, Joe was then speared through a task. I'm sorry, a table. Uh, and if you're thinking that you know, Swerve got his lick back from the previous week where Joe beat him almost to death and made him sign a contract in his own blood, you think that the match with Dustin Rhodes and Samoa Joe is called off? No, no, it is not. Later on, the match actually occurs in the main event. Samoa Joe defeats Dustin Rose by hitting him in the head with the belt. He also beat Dustin Rose to a pulp, uh, made him bleed. And uh, this was not the finest hour for Dustin. You know, um, he had no chance of winning. So I don't know. I don't get this. I know that, you know, the funny business about a Samoan named Joe versus somebody in the Rose family. I get that funny business. Um, and it's clearly a WWE uh, thing that they're doing here. Um, so was that big the question? Was Dustin being pounded and bloodied a way of punishing him for Cody's success? Or no, that's just me being a conspiracy theorist. And anyway, Samoa Joe puts the coquina clutch on Dustin Rhodes afterwards. Uh, Swerve Strickland saves him, kicks Samoa Joe in his, uh, in his turtle shell of the neck. Then he attacks him with the chain. You know, they squabble a little bit before Samoa Joe leaves. There was a time where Swerve Strickland was the most over babyface in AEW. There was a time where, you know, just the Swerve Strickland song playing got people all amped up and turned up. I'm not this week. Not right now. That, that ain't working. It is not working. So that match... First match on the show, Penta El Zero Miedo versus Adam Copeland for the TNT Championship. A fair match, decent match. It wasn't it wasn't terrible. Um, people didn't seem to buy into it. They never really seemed to care. Yes, there was a chant of, you know, this is awesome because people chant this is awesome pretty much at every match now. You could probably put Maxine Dupree in the ring with some untrained NXT talent. And if they're in there for five or ten minutes, somebody's going to chant, this is awesome. You know, that's, it's just blown out of proportion. I don't even rate this as awesome chance anymore because none of that stuff matters. So Edge wins after a after countering a springboard into a spear. It was kind of botched because it seemed like, you know, Edge was like a step or so behind. But the match wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad match. Afterwards, the lights go out because the lights are always going out in AEW. Uh, Julia Hart appears. She distracts Edge and he gets attacked by Brody King. Brody King beats up, beats Edge up. Willow Nightingale runs to the ring to help. She ends up running off Julia Hart and then Edge had to save her from Brody King. Later, Edge is out of breath. I mean, he's just not out of breath. He's just out of oxygen. I mean, he, he can't find his breath. He can't find any breath. He can't find the breath to breathe. Somebody get him an oxygen tank. Get him one of those uh, gigantic iron lungs. This guy needs some help. And basically, all they did was set up a mixed tag match for next week. It's going to be Willow, Nightingale, and Edge versus Julia Hart and Brody King. Because they're going to still have that stupid six-man tag next week. Uh, Mark Briscoe is the Ring of Honor World Champion. Now he beat uh, Schlubby Eddie Kingston. Um, in a match that bored me so much, I didn't even finish it. I only watched two matches on that entire Ring of Honor show. Uh, Hikaru Shida and Athena, which actually was not bad. And I watched the main event. I tried to. I didn't finish it. I just didn't care. I didn't care enough. I thought that, you know, Mark Briscoe winning the title would make me interested. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't work. Especially when he's booked like an absolute jabroni. On television, it doesn't do you any good. And now their best buds, 
him and Eddie Kingston are still best buddies, and they're going to be partners um, during this thing. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, I keep calling him Stokely Carmichael, Stokely Hathaway. He's just there to make jokes. He's, uh, he, his first joke from his routine was challenging Edge for the TNT title, saying that Willow wants a shot and she's going to kick his ass. That made people laugh. But what made me laugh was his second joke. When he apologized for Eddie Kingston for telling him that he smells like Burger King and Newports, because that was such a it was such a colorful visual that it was believable because Eddie Kingston literally looks like a, I'm a car mechanic who eats whoppers you know, in between lug wrenches or whatever. I mean, it's just that's just kind of how this guy goes. They did a six man thing where Jericho Hook and Shibata Shibata talks via uh, Google Translate, I think. So he's like Kane in 1990, what was that, 98, 99, where he was, I'm thirsty. So now this is Shibata's gimmick. He he types stuff into a, his phone that then speaks. Interesting. Okie dokie, whatever. But Jericho is saying that he wants Hook and Shibata to be under the learning tree. That's what he wants. And if they listen to him and, and the strategy that he laid out, they're going to win. And, of course, they did nothing of the sort. They go out there and they lose to Shane Taylor Promotions. If you may be asking yourself, who is Shane Taylor Promotions? Good question. I know who they are because, I'm again, I'm, I'm a little too deep in the wrestling streets. But the one thing that kind of jumped out at me is Anthony Agogo. This guy, I haven't seen this guy in three years. He, he's still under, under contract? Where has he been all this time? You know, like, did this guy, Roman Reigns had leukemia and was not gone as long as Anthony Agogo has been gone. I mean, you could have a literal blood cancer and you still was not gone as long as Anthony Agogo was gone. Where the hell did he go? How, why would you keep him on your roster? Not saying that he's a good, not saying he's a bad talent. I, I haven't, I don't remember whether he was any good or not. Just saying... He ain't been around. Why the hell do you keep him on the roster? Whatever. In any event, Jericho and Hook got into an argument, left Shibata by himself. Shibata got beat. Who cares? Shane Taylor is still built like a baby mama walking through the parking lot of a gas station on 7 Mile. Uh, it was a disaster. Absolute bad scenes. Not good scenes. Not good scenes at all. Uh, the Young Bucks, they show the all-in footage. We said I'm not going to talk about that. But I am going to talk about them using this footage in the storyline, claiming that they were distracted by all the chaos, and they had to put their EVP hats on because this was the biggest night in wrestling history, and they couldn't focus on their match on against FTR. Because they had to deal with that Jack Perry CM Punk thing. And <clears throat> it's a it's a decent excuse. It's actually a decent excuse. You know, if you were trying to be a man of two worlds, you know, you're trying to be an executive and a wrestler, you would kind of be distracted if there was a fight or an altercation that, you know, distracted you, that required your corporate expertise. And it eats into your preparation for your actual match. That's actually not a terrible excuse, but it is just an excuse to show the footage and talk about it. Um, they then tried to rope FTR into this thing by saying that they may have put him up to it because he was trying to make the show about himself and, and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, yeah, nobody cares. Just show the footage. They showed the footage. The crowd died. Nobody cared about anything that happened afterwards. And... <laughs> So then, because nobody cares, FTR came out there, and they started talking about, uh, they once again pumped up the nuts of AEW, that without AEW, Dax would still be shaving Cash's back, but, you know, he probably shaves Cash's back because he wants to, not because Vince McMahon told him to, he probably just does it because Cash is cool and he's a nice guy. He helps me feed my daughter. Of course, I, I'm going to shave Uncle Cash's back. Wait a second. Wait, give me, wait, give me one minute. Eh, eh, get, the, get the hell out of here, this hick. This guy's a hick. He starts talking about FTR. FTR eclipsed the Young Bucks 
They wouldn't be there without the Young Bucks. But now they've eclipsed the Young Bucks. They're the best tag team in the world. They then start talking about how the Young Bucks might be the foundation for AEW. But FTR is going to be the ones who put the roof on it. Okay. Um, that's the finishing touches, I guess. All right. All right, I guess. Who's going to be the indoor plumbing? Um, who's going to be the, electric, the electricity? Who's going to be the, the load-bearing walls of AEW? If, if FTR is going to be the roof and the Young Bucks are going to be the foundation, is House of Black the load-bearing walls? Are they the studs in the walls? You know, who's going to be the asbestos? I'm guessing that was the work horsemen. They're the asbestos of AEW. <laughs> what the fuck are they talking about? So Will Ospreay, he comes out there, he takes a jab at Triple H, saying that he's the only guy doing eight-hour flights, putting on the best pro wrestling matches. He's not afraid of the grind. And the guy who said that only got where he is because he was grinding on the boss's daughter. And uh, it's interesting. It's one of those uh, hit dog, will holler kind of situations where the internet pretty much said that he, Triple H was talking about Will Ospreay. But it wasn't necessarily him talking about Will Ospreay. He never said the name Will Ospreay. Um, so it was clearly one of those things where a hit dog holler. He wasn't the only free agent out there either. Again, Triple H also talked to Jay White. You know, he also talked to, you know, other talents who ended up going to AEW or even some who went to TNA. So we don't know, like a guy like Hammerstone, for instance. We don't know who he was talking about. Will Ospreay, again, this is what happens when you let people put a bug in your ear. He decided he was going to respond because it clearly was about him, even though if he just saw the clip, it wasn't about him. Now, it did feature some of the things that he said, but then again, a lot of other people have said the same thing. They don't like to travel that much. They don't like the scheduling. And, you know, those kinds of complaints. There's a lot of people who are in AEW. Hell, John Moxley was one of those people who said, like, hey, all those house shows and all that kind of stuff, I don't want to do that shit anymore. You know? So, it didn't necessarily have to be a, about him, but he's made it about him now. So, in this situation, I will give, I will give this burn... A six out of ten. It was good, and in, in 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 terms of turning a phrase, he turned the phrase "being afraid of the grind" to "you were grinding on the boss's daughter." All right, I'm gonna give you that. Let me give you a solid four points for that. Two two extra points for actually not flubbing it, and not screwing it up. But I can't give you a full eight or a ten. Because it's an old joke about Triple H having sex with the boss's daughter, which every single disgruntled wrestler who doesn't like Triple H mentions from, you know, Scott Steiner to Goldberg to pretty much, you know, Rob Van Dam, pretty much everybody, Sabu, everybody who has a problem with Triple H. The first thing they talk about is he was fucking the boss's daughter. So it's not anything unique, you know, so lack of creativity, bring the, bring the points down a little bit, but Thanks for trying, Will. You actually did a good job. So, I don't have a problem with him saying what he said. I'm not against him saying what he said. He said what he said because he felt that Triple H had taken a shot at him. Okay, fine. That's how these people think. That's how these people behave. I'm okay with it. Triple H is not going to lose a lick of sleep. He's going to wake up tomorrow, count his buckets of money, and not give a shit about Will Ospreay at all. Now, somebody else might take a shot at him, but I don't think Triple H will. Now, if he gets asked about it, I will be interested in seeing if he will respond, which that might be fun. Because Triple H does, he does bring out the golden shovel from time to time. So, but it would be petty of him to debate and argue with talent. Don't even bother. So, Will Ospreay continues to talk, talk talking about his opponent now, Brian Danielson. He starts talking about Danielson. Uh, being one of the best in the world and that uh, Danielson can't be the best until he grounds the aerial assassin, but younger, healthier, and better men have tried and failed and that he can't call himself the best wrestler until he beats Brian Danielson. I'm going to give him a lot of credit for his promo because this show had the energy of a hospital waiting room until this promo happened. And then people started to wake up. It was right after he took that shot at Triple H. 
people started to really get into this promo. When he starts talking about Danielson, people were up. They were interested. Um, they were interested in this, this match being sold to them. So he, he's his promo was successful. Even if you didn't like the content, his promo was successful. Of the things on the show that got over, this was a thing that on the show that got over. Can't be mad at that. I forgot that the Young Bucks participated in, in programming as well. Kazuchika Okada defeated a Jabberino. And um, Mike, not Mike, I'm sorry, Tony Schiavone, he's at, he's at that announce desk and he is suffering. I mean, this guy is, ooh, he's having a tough day. <laughs> he even starts dissing the Jabber saying that this guy bores me. This level of competition. <laughs> <laughs> he don't want to be that no more. It seemed like it's it, it don't, it's not fun anymore, huh? It's struggling. Okada easily wins, of course. Uh, Okada gets on the microphone, accepts Pox challenge for I don't know if it was Dynasty or whatever, but Pac comes out. He's attacked by the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks are in the ring. They're attacking Pac, beating them up, and they're playing to the crowd. And the crowd is chanting CM Punk at them because they have successfully made CM Punk the star of their show. Their promo was all about he was trying to make this all about himself. And now you've talked about him, showed him on your screen. And not only were the people applauding CM Punk for what he did, but then they started chanting CM Punk at you in the ring. You did a great job. You're going to sell a ton of t-shirts. <laughs> FTR came to the ring. Okada and the Young Bucks jumped uh, FTR and Pac and beat them with chairs to absolutely no reaction. You can hear the sound of the chair shot bouncing off the walls. Nobody cared at all about this, this angle. Nobody cares about these people. Nobody cares about this angle. It's all dead. It's... Unfortunate, but it is what it is. Speaking of dead, the Bang Bangs, uh, the Bang Bang Gang, Jay White tried to get people to believe that he beat up Billy Gunn last week. When that didn't occur, he got treated like Wiley Coyote all last week. But he's going to wrestle on Rampage, and I, I don't care. Don't care at all. They did a champagne toast with Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm. The gams on Tony Storm are generational. I mean, not quite what she would have, not quite what she was in like, you know, 2019 ish. But my goodness, the gams on that girl. She's something else. Anyway, Thunder Rosa comes out. They're going to toast. I don't know what they were supposed to be doing because they went immediately to the heat of Tony Storm throwing champagne in the eyes of Tony of Thunder Rosa and then hitting her in the head with a metal pan. She then used a towel to wipe all her face paint off. Which was supposed to get a ton of heat because it's all Aztec or Mezcal stuff that's about her heritage or whatever. And this is what Tony Schiavone's on commentary yelling about. She cares so much about her heritage. And everybody's like, ah, it's just face paint. They don't care. Deanna Perazzo comes out there and Tony Storm humorously flees, just runs away, which is, <laughs> which is great. Uh, Deanna tries to help up Thunder Rosa, who gets she gets shoved, and it seems like she says "f Thunder Rosa" and storms off. At least that's what it seemed like she did. But Deanna Perazzo, boy, she dissolved in water, didn't she? She has she been there a full month and a half yet? Oh, brother, oh brother. Mm. Anyway, Maya May came out there, and she's going to wrestle Anna Jay. So two very attractive women are about to have a really bad match, and they, that's what they happened. They didn't have a good one, but at least both girls were cute. So you couldn't look on that screen and see anything ugly. After the match, uh, Mariah May wins, of course. Uh, Anna Jay attacks Mariah May, puts her in a chokehold, uh, and she's not going to let that thing go. So then you start hearing this Mex Mexicanese kind of music, this Mexican Japanese hybrid theme. It's playing. I'm looking at the stream like, what is going on? What is this? All the people of, what is this, Kentucky, West Virginia, that they're it? None of these people know who this person is. A Japanese girl runs to the ring, 
and she chases off Anna J, beats her up, chases Anna J off. She then gets two glasses of champagne and she cups the head of Mariah May and pours champagne in Mariah May's mouth. And then she kissed her in the mouth. Now, humana, humana, humana. That's the way to make a debut. All elite kissing, all lesbians kissing. I'm, I'm all about that one, brother. Sign me up for the chick. I don't even know who that girl is. What, what was her name? I know her name was Mina something. She's a Japanese girl, Asian girl, cute girl too. Kiss Mariah May right in the mouth. I'm like, woo. Wait a minute. Is somebody going to kiss somebody every week on this show? Is this like uh, MTV's Undressed? <laughs> like, what is going on here? You know, like, she's hot too. I'm like, okay. All right. Mariah May, she's just irresistible. You see her, you just want to kiss her in the mouth. I'm going to kiss you in the mouth. Give me some sugar. I don't know what's going on. I think uh, from the commentary that these two people used to be on a tag team in Japan. At least I think so. I'm not that deep in the weeds. I'm just trying to remember what the commentary said. Because my brain saw lesbians kissing. And I was just like, oh, 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 oh. That's that toxic masculinity that they like to talk about. I'm like, why is she kissing her in the mouth? Can she do it again? Anyway. Uh, so Mariah May, she's just being kissed by everybody. So they did it. They did the most funny Mercedes Monet promo of all time. This is turning into such a huge bomb. And I hate to be like the WWE Homer, but clearly it was production magic that was saving Mercedes, man. She lacks personality. She can't talk. But the funniest thing was the camera work. Bro, go watch this. Go watch this. Before we even get into the promo, go watch the camera work. How the camera kept backing up and then zooming in. Backing up, zooming in on Mercedes. It's like, who is the cameraman for this thing? One second, you're tight as hell on her face. The next, you're backing up and then you zoom right back in. It's like, why? Find something you're comfortable with and stick with it. Right? She's not even saying anything important enough for you to emphasize that you're going to zoom into her face like that. It was so terrible. It was so funny. Once I noticed it, bro, I couldn't stop looking at it. Once I noticed it, I couldn't stop looking at it. It was hilarious. Now, let's talk about the content of this thing. So, she starts, everything about Mercedes is about self-promotion. So, she's going to say the words money and the word history every single time. So, and, and put those two things together. So, for her... Double or Nothing was about making history. Five years ago, Double or Nothing made history. So she wants to make more history this year at Double or Nothing. And money changes everything. That's okay. Sure. So then she she broke out a George Bush line, which I <laughs> So she's trying to put over the girls in the match. So she gotta put over Julia Hart. So she's asked about Julia Hart and she just says, oh, Julia Hart, uh, she's just so unpredictable. Like, you just can't predict her. I'm just like, what? You know, like. <laughs> she's so unpredictable. Like, you just can't predict her. Like, yeah, that's what unpredictable means, man. What are you doing? What is this? You went to promo class. Why are you so bad at this? Maybe you need a refresher course. Maybe you need to, maybe you need to go back to remedial promo class. You already said she was unpredictable. So you don't need to say that you just can't predict it. We don't need to say that. And then everything lacked energy. There was no character. There was, oh, this was so bad. I, I feel so bad because I believe in Mercedes. I like her. I've always talked about her being a diva, but I generally am a fan, generally. But this is not good. You know, this is like when, you know, the early days of John Moxley, when everybody was like, what's the big deal? I mean, I did a video like, what's the big deal with John Moxley, man? Like, 
I would heard he was one of the best promos of all time and all that horse shit. And for a long time, he didn't have nothing important to say. He didn't do anything important. And then over time, he became a, you know, I think he got back in the groove of doing promos. But Mercedes is just, <laughs> she is cringe consistently on on the stick without a writer or whatever. And I would hate to think that somebody actually wrote this stuff. But whatever. So after she <laughs> loses track of who she's supposed to be talking about, she puts over why her and Willow have issues. Because she lost to Willow and Willow, you know, she broke her leg. And the lights go out. So then once the lights come back on, Mercedes is laying down and she's moaning, you know, um, like she was exchanging fuck faces with Scarface. Uh, 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 like it's, uh, you know, uh, for the love of money. And I'm just like, what's happening here? So they're trying to introduce some mystery into this story. That Mercedes, somebody turned the lights out. She got attacked. The lights came back on. She's on the ground. Uh, uh, uh. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. At least it's an attempt at, you know, uh, adding some level of mystery to this thing. But it's not good. It, it, it ain't good. It's clearly going to end up being Willow or Chris Statlander, right? Um. Uh, I like mysteries. Wrestling should have mysteries. It should be a whodunit. You know? It should just feed better. This was not a good promo. She was not promoted. But we're already not promoting her anymore. I wonder if anybody noticed. Now there's some people saying that she is not being paid in anywhere near $10 million. Of course, Tony Khan nor her will confirm or deny how much money she's being paid. But now they're saying that she's not making anywhere near $10 million, which, you know, seems unreasonable when I first heard it. But I don't know what Tony Khan's bank account is like, and I don't know what hers is like. I don't know what the conversations are like. But I'm looking at this thing now, man, and saying, it's a tough one. <laughs> um, because the women's division is getting more attention. They're doing more stuff with the women. But the stuff that they're doing isn't particularly good. And the stuff with the men isn't particularly good. And I know a lot of AEW fans, they're looking at this show and saying, in the first hour of the show, there was basically one match. There was a bunch of angles and backstage stuff. And then it went into the footage. And then the matches that they did have, they weren't any good. It wasn't up to the standard. And I will say this as a person who doesn't particularly like AEW. This show was not even in the in-ring part. Did not reach the standard that AEW has set for the past five years. So even if you are a person who generally likes AEW, there was no huge, really good wrestling match on this show that's going to, you know, that eats up a lot of time that people will rant and rave about afterwards. That didn't even do that. It was a collection of angles and storyline stuff. Some of which didn't really hit and nobody really cared. And the biggest star of the show ended up being CM Punk. So I don't know what to tell you, but these dynamites that they've been having lately with no stars on them, no Moxley, no Danielson, nothing to do with uh, Claudio, nothing to do with Malachi Black, no Ricky Starks, nobody who could possibly entertain at a high level on his program. They're not being featured, you know? So how do you expect to keep people engaged? They even stopped featuring guys that they were featuring a lot before, like Orange Cassidy and Daniel Garcia. Those guys aren't even featured anymore. When was the last time Wheeler Yuta was on television, you know, doing something important? Like, I don't know. I know, I know Moxley's in Japan. I think he's about to wrestle for the uh, New Japan title or something like that. I don't know. And I know um, Danielson for a while was in Mexico wrestling legendary luchadors because that's always what he wants to do. It's like you're paying this guy to run your television to be involved with your product. And you letting him have dream matches in Mexico and your television is losing viewers and your television is suffering while you got these guys in Mexico and Japan or at home doing nothing. 
I don't I don't get that, man. <laughs> I don't get how that is beneficial to your company. But I'm not the guy running the company, so I don't know. It's the one thing about Philip is that when he said this is not a real business, that shit stuck like Velcro. That shit stuck like Gorilla Glue. And this episode of Dynamite says a lot. It doesn't look like it's a, a show written for people to be watching it or written for like it's not even a show that the people who love the product would even like. I have no idea who this show is for. This is legitimately one of the worst dynamites of all time. Easily. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen on television. The best thing about this was two girls kissing. Legitimately. The only thing that got me excited about this entire program was an unknown Japanese girl kissing Mariah May in the mouth. And maybe that's because I'm a pervert. But Will Ospreay cutting promos on Triple H. I've heard Triple H be dissed by your fucking the boss's daughter. Okay. I've heard that before. I don't care about that. I don't care about your match with Danielson. Danielson is not even promoting this match. He's, again, Kane and Kung Fu. Ryu from Street Fighter. Mexico. And that's what he's doing. You're here talking about Triple H and trying to sell West Virginians on a match. This guy is in Mexico. He's not thinking about you. He don't care about you. You know, like, this is, this is weird. And poor Swerve. He's going to be the main event of this show. And this thing's struggling to get off the ground. I heard that the uh, ticket sales for Double or Nothing were pretty slow. I'm not surprised. I am not surprised. Look at the quality of their product. And they've been running around saying that the quality of their product is the best it's ever been. We're doing some of the best shows we've ever done. I ain't seeing them. When these shows were produced, where are they? Because I've seen nothing but like at least four months of TV. It's been absolutely dreadful. Occasionally you would have a big match here or there that would be interesting. But they're not even having those anymore. So. Let me know what you guys think. Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out.